Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Higher Ed Live. I'm joining you today from Brunswick, Maine, and uh, my colleague from Louisville, Kentucky, or the London of the South, as we have recently discussed. And I will be served, my name is Gil Rogers, and I'll be serving as your host today. Um, higher Ed Live has offered direct access to the best and brightest minds in higher education and allowed audience members to share knowledge and participate in discussion around the most important issues in our industry. All episodes are free and can be accessed at higheredlive.com or take Higher Ed Live with you on the go by subscribing to the podcast wherever you listen. Higher Ed Live is produced by Platform Q Education, the leading developer of online engagement software and strategies. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe to our newsletter below and connect with us on social media, either at Higher Ed Live or using the hashtag Higher Ed Live. For our podcast listeners, all of this information will be in the episode notes. This week, we are having a fireside chat with my friend and colleague, Len Napolitano, or Nappy for short, uh, CEO of Capture Higher Ed. Uh, Len, uh, Nappy comes to us with over 20 years experience in ed tech uh, to pair it with my close to, but not quite 20 years experience in enrollment marketing uh, and technology. And we're gonna be talking today about trends in ed tech and what we you know, the history uh, of the of the industry and kind of where we see things going. So Nappy, you wanna give us a little bit of your background before we, we dive in and get started? First, I just wanna say uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you to Gil and team for inviting me to this episode. Uh, my background is probably a little bit different or probably similar to a lot of entrepreneurs. You know, started uh, in ed tech at KPMG Pete Marwick, uh, where I had the opportunity to meet uh, Matt Patinsky and Michael Chasen. And they had this idea to start a company called Blackboard. And I had the fortunes to leave KPMG and become their first salesperson. They looked at me and said, hey, would you like to work at a startup? Uh, there'll be six of us. You'll never wear a suit again. And I said, absolutely. And I was <laughs> out the door. Uh, I was in my 20s at the time. And I thought this can be better, right? I knew nothing about education technology. Now, I was a grants manager uh, at KPMG. So working with Research One at the time, Research One Universities, and helping them assess their grants management or execution of grants. But inevitably, I really didn't understand the power of ed tech. And that was how I entered into the ed tech world and was fortunate enough to do 10 years at a company called Blackboard, then went to Presidium with a gentleman by the name of Greg Davies, uh, which then eventually becomes a Blackboard company as they reimagine student services, and then went back with Dr. Matthew Patinsky to reimagine credentials with a company called Parchment and did almost 10 years there prior to becoming CEO of Capture. And all awesome. along the way, I was in the military, but that's not nearly as exciting. Oh, I'm I'm sure I'm sure. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you for your service, and uh, of course, you know we uh, are are excited to talk to you today with that wealth of experience that you share. One of the things I know that that we talk about pretty regularly, either between Platform Q and Capture as companies or uh, just as individuals is kind of how things have so rapidly changed over the past 15 months. But before the past 15 months, there was 15 years of, of rapid change, right? And so I'd love your kind of your your insights into what, you know, past 15 months, it was it was kind of COVID as a catalyst for this, this change, right? But over the past dec two decades, there's been other changes and other advancements that have supported enrollment managers, that have supported institutions seeking to better serve their student audiences, whether it be new students all the way through alumni engagement. What have you seen on the on the ed tech side over the past 20 years or so uh, that, that has provided lessons that maybe we can look forward to for the future? Well, that's sweeping. Um, I think there are uh, a few in that, I would not say ed tech, I would not say post second, the US post secondary ed education industry. And it is an industry, right? So I think first mm -hmm. and foremost, you have to have the understanding that institutions are complex organizations and as such are complex businesses. Right now, their mission is different, and many of them, the majority of them are nonprofit, but they are businesses and probably some of the most complex businesses you know, we know of, right? You know, from the, those that are research institutions with healthcare systems to even the community colleges that are need to be entrepreneurial as their markets or their geographic 
locales are constantly changing by the industries there, the populations, demographics, et cetera. And so with that, I would say higher education traditionally is not on the bleeding edge. And I think that's okay because of the mission of an institution, right? And most I would say are there to, you know, not only to educate, but to encourage civility, right? And a sense of the citizenry that we, we hope for in, uh, in our students. I also would say there have been actors that have helped push higher education, not so much in this chronological order, but I think it's worth mentioning. For profits were a critical force. It, people forget in the late 1990s, the early 2000s, for profits did push the nonprofits as reimagining their student as a type of consumer. Now, it, now I use that term consumer in a broad sense, but they did, and all of a sudden what you see by 2004, you know, innovation is more than just technology. You saw this rise of student service centers. What are these one-stop shops? In order for me to encourage the students to engage with support services, in order for us to continue, for, you know, the, for them to continue their education. Then there's that underlying technology that then supports them along the way. So about, you know, the, we forget before e-learning became such a boom, there was the ERP providers. And then you saw the e-learning providers, which mm -hmm. actually dovetail nicely with then we finally see by, by the late 90s, early 2000, the growth in our student populations in every way, right? The for-profit, the non-profits, the graduate level, undergraduate level, a variety of market factors and demographic factors. From there, we saw this rise then of portfolio, from portfolio with our transaction system. And we continue to see that, you know, happen. But to say higher ed was wanting that necessarily, I would say it was probably sometimes a bit of you were pulling them as other markets or other industries were already there in reimagining their operations, mm -hmm. right? I would say COVID probably, I would say higher education caught up very quickly to a number of industries because their business had never really, for the most part, operated in such an environment where many other businesses are, already had. Yeah, yeah. Credit for for enrollment managers and admissions folks over the past oh. you know year and a half, that they, they uh, we we've heard for the past 15, 10, 15 years, higher ed moves glacially slow. It takes time. We you know we have to tr we have, we need proof that these things work. But when we needed to, we changed on a dime, right? And we're able to to do these sorts of things. And so let's think about that. But I, I love your thoughts on you know one of the things that I talk about a lot is you know I, we focus on virtual engagement and the content that's needed, particularly for enrollment and recruitment. That's one of the major things that changed rap rapidly because mm -hmm. the pandemic hit during yield season, right? And so that was a catalyst for a lot of that change. And what's, what's developed over the past year, year and a half has been this kind of the spectrum with respect to how how institutions develop content for, for students, right? So on one end of the spectrum, we have on-demand pre-recorded content, right? That's virtual tours, virtual view books, video pages on websites. And those are great because they're accessible, standalone, but the a virtual tour doesn't necessarily move the, me the, move the needle on enrollment decisions, right? And so, on the other end of the spectrum, we see, I need to be live all the time, right? That's the, the Zoom sessions, the slate shares, the I need to do a webinar and I have to have live Q&A because people, or I wanna have a meeting with faces on the screen so I can have these conversations because that's what people want is that that yearning for connection, right? And so what we've identified is there's there's this wide gap in the middle, right? The, the virtual tour, that's for the president to point out and say, hey, we have a virtual tour, just like they point out, we have a billboard off the highway to the faculty to show them that they're they're doing cool things. The live components, that's that's for us to feel like we're really part of that experience. But there's that that gap of combination of live, pre-recorded, on demand. How do you see that fitting? I know the work that you all do with looking at behavioral data and looking at how students are engaging with an institution, where do you see the shifts in engagement strategies, particularly virtually, tying in with how institutions should look at their data and use those decisions for some of those legacy tactics and, and maybe either sunsetting or enhancing them. So I actually would re reframe your statement and I would do so in this way. COVID forced us to act on the data that we already knew about as institutions. 
And I, so I think that is first and foremost. We knew that the demographics of the U.S. population was changing. We knew, we knew that retention was critical. We knew that overall college enrollment was pretty much stagnant over the past four years. So we, we knew that. And we also knew that a significant number of our states were going to start seeing declines in enrollment coupled with as some states became very creative, creative in their tuition offering at the public institution level, both four-year and two-year. And then lastly, we understood that students at any level were reimagining what what the experience was. Do I go for a certificate? Do I piece together my academic experience? COVID forced us to say, oh my gosh, we have to act now. Where prior to COVID, we all knew about it. And I share this as a trustee of a college that I'm a, a part of, right? All this data was in our face, right? We, we, we've done studies. Met, most schools have done strategic plans and no, read the strategic plans up to 2020. Go to any institution. Many of those pages are still alive. So then, I think the next thing as you were discussing, so I think that framework is critical then for any further discussion. At that point, there is a segmentation of the shifts to say, okay, there is, as you mentioned, there's, you know, do we go virtual? Like, you know, there's streaming, there's live, there's just static. I think that's in any way, you could say this is the what happened with e-learning, right? Schools went entirely online or it was just this courses were dead. And we realized you have to bring those two together in order for the end user being the student to feel connected, right? So that, that, that's really, the student has to feel connected with the content, with the mission, and th it, it aligns with their purpose, right? That is, it, it has to align with their purpose. And, and also that's your value statement and purpose. So that's mm -hmm. marketing, push that aside. I then would say what has changed, so map it first, COVID made us realize demographics, the story then cascades further down, Behaviors traditionally occur with emerging technologies that we either go one way, we need to get to that blended moderate way, right? So how do we then take it? I think now then to address the last part of your statement, which was where you asked your question, it then comes to, it is incumbent upon us at this point to create engagements, whatever they are, at a micro level with micro conversions. And what I mean by that is that it is inevitable that as our nation continues to diversify in every way, this is more than just demographics, it's interest, it's my purpose, it's what I wanna do, it's how I, it's how I you know, think about my career and my you know, progression in life. Institutions then also have to think about, okay, how do I go about creating that connection with the student, right? I do wanna pause, there is a worthy tangential statement to institutional leaders. You must also think about your programs. We cannot be McDonald's as institutions. You know, I think people forget, and this is also an industry, let's look at industries that have already gone through this. So Starbucks, when Howard came back and took over, Starbucks and McDonald's went through the same thing. Over expansion, we offered everything. We are gonna, you know, offer everything from McRib to McPasta, right? Well, that wasn't their core. And then they realized, okay, we have to adjust. And the same thing Starbucks did. Starbucks reduced their menu, right? So I share people, you can hyper-connect and create personal connections with a limited offering because the way you present your offering is relevant to that buyer. Remember, they're a consumer, how we start off our conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, what is then the role of technology so you can leverage that behavior and those aspirations, right? It's, it's bigger than just a capture or a platform queue or some of those other phenomenal technologies. You must believe in the principle that if this behavior, how do I analyze that behavior and have my team react on behavior with a measurable way that continues to keep my marketing spend stagnant? And that is going to be uncomfortable for institutions to hear that those terms, but your marketing spend must be stagnant and be reevaluated. I'll pause there because that was a fairly yep. long response, but I thought it was worth cascading the story and then bringing in I, historical trends to understand the position I take. 
Yeah, and I and I love your I love the analogy there and thinking about the the McDonald's and Starbucks and the expansion of the menu, right? Because think about where we're heading now as an industry again in the scope of you know admissions, enrollment, and marketing. As we we start to hopefully exit the pandemic and and seek to get back to quote unquote normal, right? We know that normal is not going to be what it was pre pandemic, but so many people that we talk to and our team here is the same is, well, we need, we're going to be asked to go back to travel and go back to hosting campus visits and regional programs. But we also see the value in virtual content and events and programs. So now we're going to be asked to do all of it when we have the same size staff or smaller because of turnover and transitions and everything else. And so <laughs> loaded, loaded ask, advice to people in that situation and what they should be doing uh, i mean actually i think that's relatively easy right because so and, and this is not meant to you know come across with a lack of empathy it is with a sense of empathy first of all you know i'm the vp of enrollment you have two ways to plan your enrollment cycle you have your current enrollment cycle and then you should already be looking at 2023 and 2024 with your president fact Right. Why yep. is that? Right? So then you look at the demographics and many of them say, we're going to offer these new programs. Well, based upon those new programs, if I was knowing my new programs that I was offering, immediately I would start doing an assessment depending on the type of institution you're recruiting. This example is for a high school to college example, even though we have a diverse student population. Yep. But I'll use yep. different. I would then at that point you know, research. What are those high schools that would be particularly applicable based upon that major that I'm trying to grow by 2023 and 2024? That, that information's available on which high schools are investing in that. From there, then you could start that. That is a meaning. Now I create those meaningful connections. So I'm not going to every college tour, but how do I make that meaningful connection? What's a way for me to extend my brand without having to extend a significant amount of resources? Do you do an influencer campaign with those high school guidance counselors and that begins to leverage right that's a two to three year campaign you're leveraging the virtual events you're tying in their behavior with digital advertising from there you're doing your email campaign from there you're doing an education about why these types of programs are so valuable and what that means right connection to that population that that high school represents right and why right so that's your influence and now when you think about those students right okay based upon these behaviors what is that connection not only with events, but a representation of who communicates the event. So your counselors at times, it is easy for us to say, we, we got to get back on the road. But is that the way I want to be connected with a person? Again, mm -hmm. with that population, do they need to connect? Or is there a way to have that meaningful connection between influencers and students in a way that doesn't rely on a physical? Uh, yeah. Because the physical on so many levels at times, so people will say, if you read, there was a great uh, book. Ah, oh, that was it. Pasquarello, uh, who wrote this book back oh, on admissions book. I read it in grad school. Now it's killing me. And we'll just, look it up and we'll put it in the description you know, so we can. But it yeah. talks about yeah. you know the role of the student, you know, and the, the, the psychology of influencing. And yeah. I think that's still relevant. All VPs of enrollment probably have read it. But it is taking the data. I I didn't start by just saying we have to go to these high schools. I said, okay, where do I want to take my institution? Backwards plan the data. From there, then saying based upon that, what is what do we where do we want to be by our numbers? Then take a calculation of your marketing dollars, execute the revenue per spend. From there, divide your budget, reduce your travel budget by 20% immediately. Take that additional 20%, divide that by 50%, hold that, do not spend that. Leverage that for your yield campaign. Take the other 10% and begin to leverage that for a variety of technology engagements for those populations. That is a mathematical calculated approach for you to execute a plan. I, I love I love that because I think what the, the concern that, that we hear and read a lot is, it, it's not about completely dropping travel or completely dropping legacy things. 
-hmm. It's about calibrating the plan for a more sustainable approach. And taking 20% of travel is leaving 80% of travel, right? And so, and but the the amount that we spend in those things, I mean, we've had institutions over the past two years that they they loaded up on long-term programs with Conduit and, and I'm sure with, with, with the behavioral intelligence platform because they had so much savings from travel last cycle that they were able to do so many other things and they locked those things in for the long-term. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I, I want to. So I was working with the VP of enrollment of a highly selective institution, and they use a variety of technologies. So, uh, but they are so they have a, a very high yield. This institution significantly so what in excess of thirty percent. So this is an institution that many would envy their application, yeah, yeah. Rate, their yield, etc. But they have a small counseling team, and the individual and I were talking, and the individual said, "I am so fortunate." to be able to use the suite of technologies. And I said, why is that? It made my counselors more efficient. And I said, well, what do you mean? And the individual said, well, I was able to leverage, now I capture has affinity scores. And just remember, they're now looking at yield now. They're executing a yield campaign. So technology is more than just top of funnel. It's at every stage of the funnel. And leveraging the data from a series of technologies they realized they can generate the same yield for their counselors while reducing the amount of work by 40% by prioritizing the students. And he's like, so what I was able to do is able to ensure that my counselors were having them a meaningful conversation with the right students in order for those students to continue to progress. And we still address those other students, but we were able to prioritize. As many of you know, I, I can't add counselors. We don't have that budget. So I have to help them focus. And the combination of technologies and those technologies integrating enabled us to prioritize our staff to generate the results with 40% less noise. And that was beneficial for us. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think to your, what you mentioned before um, was, you know, the, the counselors saying, oh, we got to get back on the road. I don't, I don't feel like it's all the counselors. I think some of it's the, the, the board and above thinking the optics of effort, right? And I want to see the people out in the field. But if you talk to many admissions counselors, you know, look at the job postings that are out there in a lot of roles. There's a lot of turnover at that level because there's, we're looking ahead to having to go back to that grind versus what you just mentioned, which is cutting out 40% of the noise and being able to do my job more efficiently. Are Hampton endpoints and Delta airline miles and those sorts of things attractive? Sure, but there's comes a point where the redundancy and the optics of effort becomes not worth that that time, right? And so I think that these are all things we need to think about as we head into, I hate to say the new normal and the new reality because that's been overplayed and overcoined at this point. But that's the type, uh, that, that point you just made is what we have to think about is how do we best leverage the, the technology to make more informed decisions so we're not burning out our staff. I think being being a burned out admission staff used to be a rite of passage. It used to be something, there's a, a point of pride in mid-November and December when you're on Twitter complaining about how bad that high school visit was. Why do we have that point of pride? Why don't we move into being more student-centric and student-focused and being able to have better outcomes and be able to sleep at our house at night more often uh, right. versus versus being, you know, right. waiting, for the, waiting for someone to come talk to us at a fair, right? So, uh, Nappy, I, 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 I really do appreciate your time. We could talk for hours on this. I reserve the right for a sequel in season two uh, for us to continue this conversation. But as we, as we kind of end and close, I'd love, you know, we talked about the past 20 years. What gets you excited about the next 20 years? And also as part of that, how can people get in touch with you, get connected with Capture um, if they want to continue the dialogue directly? Uh, so what do I see for the next 20 years? I, I couldn't be more excited. So first of all, higher education has always, you know, been changing, right? We forget about World War II, our college campuses were used to educate cadets, right? And soldiers. And then we forget about what happened post-World War II or, you know, the economic crisis of 1898 or the collapse of institutions during the Civil War. But we are so resilient, right? And there's a reason why we're resilient. And so that, so when I look about the next 20 years, how fortunate are we to think about that our nation will continue to be at the forefront of ed or attempting to educate the majority of its population. And as we fulfill that mission, 
we must realize the role technology plays. And I think we're going to continue to see the personalization of the academic experience from the minute that you are known to retaining the student. Remember, so if we have a decline in some of the traditional age populations, if we keep our students, we're able to maintain our net tuition, which then enables us to reinvest back in our institution into those technologies and other things. So I think we're only going to continue to see at least over the next 10 years, the personalization of the academic experience, right, in every regards, from the type of curriculum to the, from the recruitment to then the, as they enroll and to the services that we provide from mental health services to the type of tutoring services we offer to, you know, and to also we'll see the diversification of other areas of our institutions to the, you know, the types of programs, certificate programs, especially. Should you want to get in touch with me, it's very easy. It's just nap, like I'm taking a nap, N-A-P, at CaptureHighRed.com. Uh, so not terribly difficult. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I need a nap after this. Oh, my gosh. What a, what a energizing and what a what a exciting 25 minutes or so. A, amazing conversation. We love the work that you all are doing. Love the work that you're doing. Uh, and we appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to join us today. To our listening and viewing audience, we thank you for taking the time to join us on Higher Ed Live, and we will see you next time.